When Newport had left in August, Jamestown seemed to be in relatively good shape. Four and a half months later, he returned to find nearly two-thirds of the colonists dead, the deposed president of the council under arrest, one member of the council shot, and another about to be hanged. The leading gentry had decided to desert the colony, and they hadn't discovered or produced anything even remotely valuable. But believe it or not, this episode's going to be about how the Virginia Company came and messed everything up. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. Newport had brought a hundred men, including Gosnold's brother, Anthony, and lots of supplies. Even more were on his companion ship, commanded by Francis Nelson, which had been lost in the fog as they'd approached Virginia. He put the settlers to work building a storehouse, kitchen, and church. He also stripped Smith of the title of Kate Merchant and gave it to a newcomer. This weakened Smith's control over relations with the Indians, which Smith obviously didn't like, but which some of the colonists did because they were uncomfortable with some of his rougher tactics. He also put Martin in charge of finding a sample of gold-bearing earth to take back to England. Newly added to the council was a man named Matthew Scrivener. We don't know much about him, but he was related to Edward Maria Wingfield by marriage, and he had the rare quality of being held in high esteem by pretty much everyone. He was considered understanding and wise beyond his years, and he quickly became a very trusted member of the colony's leadership. Percy was still excluded, despite the council's lack of numbers. Now, there were plenty of spies and saboteurs running around Jamestown, and the colony experienced its fair share of bad luck, too. Thanks to one or the other, as soon as everything was built and most of the supplies had been unloaded from the ships, a stray spark burned the entire settlement to the ground. All the buildings, all the clothes, most of the food, and the luxuries like Hunt's library of books. Virtually the only thing that had escaped was a mattress that one of the colonists had bought that was considered the single lowest priority item to unload from the ships. Ratcliffe's hand was also badly hurt in a shooting accident, and he wouldn't heal for months. It was the first week of January, and hope turned to despair, and it was at this point that Smith distracted the company with tales of his adventures. Fortunately, Wahoon Seneca started sending bi-weekly gifts of food to the colonists, as well as things like raccoon hides for Newport, which he was told that he could share with his son, John Smith. Pocahontas led each envoy as a peace symbol, and in part thanks to Smith's story, the English pr interpreted this as her defying her father. That's just an interesting example of cultural misunderstanding, and it didn't really make a difference because soon Smith and Newport left Jamestown to go visit Wahoon Seneca at Werowokomoko. They left Jamestown in the hands of Ratcliffe and Martin and took Scrivener, Gosnold, and Tyndall, as well as some others, to the Powhatan capital. This was a very important meeting, and one which would ultimately mark the beginning of the end of English Powhatan friendship. Remember that Smith and Wahoon Seneca were both playing a game. They both had stuff that they wanted from the other. Wahoon Seneca wanted guns, and Smith wanted corn, and they both saw the other as a potentially dangerous enemy. So they were both following the same principles. Be as nice as you can, be as harsh as you have to, and never show weakness. Because like Machiavelli said, if you have to choose, it's better to be feared than loved. Newport didn't adhere to this. He wasn't looking at the long-term stability of the colony like Smith was. His motivation was getting rich fast. This was partially self-serving because he did get a portion of whatever was found, unlike Smith and the colonists, and he didn't have to live there. He did, however, also have to answer directly to the London company. Every time he returned, the first thing he had to do was give an account for the mission, and when he'd returned last time, the lack of gold had caused a panic among the shareholders. No money, no mission, so to get money, Newport wanted to present as little of a threat as possible, and to do nothing that could even possibly irritate the Powhatan. He wasn't authorized to give them weapons, but short of that, he would submit himself to Wahoon Seneca in every way in the hopes of making the leader feel comfortable giving him the information he wanted. So Smith went ahead to prevent an ambush, and he presented the gifts that they had brought for Wahoon Seneca, a red suit, a white greyhound, a hat, and some jewels. The leader was pleased, and he declared a perpetual league and friendship with the English. 
He asks Smith and his men to lay down their arms at his feet like his subjects did, and Smith refused, saying that the English considered that a gesture demanded by enemies, not friends. But to prove their friendship, he promised to use these weapons in service of the Powhatan and to give the leader one of Newport's other children, Thomas Savage, the 13-year-old son of an aristocratic family. It was good enough, and in exchange, Wahoon Seneca sent Namantak, Archer's friend, to go live with the English in exchange for Savage, and asked to meet Newport and negotiate trade. So Newport came, and this is where things started to go badly. When Wahoon Seneca asked to see the items that he'd be trading for, Smith told Newport to refuse. He said that the Powhatan leader was trying to lower the price of the items, but Newport didn't want to do anything to irk him, so Newport agreed to the request. The result was that they ended up with about a fifth of the amount of corn that they'd expected, and they permanently cheapened the value of English copper. He'd also put the English in the position of weakness that Smith had tried so hard to avoid even when he was a prisoner. To make matters worse, Newport's crew had yet again stolen the company's goods for their own profit. This time, they'd eaten most of the remaining food raised for the settlers, and they were trading the remaining goods directly with the Indians, which caused rampant inflation within the colony. Now, a pound of copper was no longer enough to buy what had previously been bought for an ounce. At this inflated rate, the English had gotten enough corn to last a couple of months. When they returned to Jamestown, Newport also ordered people to start looking for gold instead of rebuilding the fort, yet again dismaying Smith. Smith complained that Ratcliffe, Martin, and the refiners had turned the men into slaves. Martin specifically excluded Smith from this venture and accused him of being motivated by the desire to find the gold himself. On April 10th, 1608, Newport's first supply left Jamestown. It left the colonists in a worse position than it found them. They had little food, no buildings, not much to keep them warm, a decreased ability to negotiate for the things that they needed, and a mattress. Newport was carrying more supposed ore demanded by Cecil and the Virginia Company, and his ship also carried a request by John Smith for some Poles and Germans to be recruited to the company. Namantak was also on board, heading to England to learn more about their culture, and so was Wingfield. Wingfield would never return to Jamestown. In London, as news of the faction fighting spread, he took the opportunity to put forward his side of the story with his own accusations. He said that Smith was unfit for the title of a gentleman, that he begged in Ireland like a rogue without a license, that Martin was lazy and that he used his illness as an excuse to avoid leaving the fort, and that the only two times he'd left the fort, he'd stayed within a couple hundred yards. He said that while he had brought a lot of the chickens and bred a lot of the chickens, he'd only ever eaten one, whereas Ratcliffe had eaten three or four. He said that Smith, Martin, and Ratcliffe were trying to overthrow the king's government and establish a triumvirate for their own greed. Again, I would say it's pretty likely that the accusations all had their roots in the truth, and in fact, many of the colonists reiterated Wingfield's complaints about Martin, including a servant that he himself had brought to Virginia. The London Company ignored both sets of accusations, but the infighting didn't look good to investors. A few weeks after Newport left, Francis Nelson's ship that had been lost in the fog arrived. Unlike Newport's disastrous visit, Nelson really did bring everything that the settlers could have wished for. His sailors were honest, he brought supplies, and he was just a very decent person. Even Smith liked him. He'd also brought enough supplies to get the colonists through the next six months as their crops grew. Nelson was just a hired captain. He had his commission and he had his payment. He wasn't given leadership in the colony or any incentives to go out looking for precious metals. And in fact, when Smith asked Nelson to help him explore the falls, Nelson refused. Without Newport pushing them to try to find gold, the question arose of what they should actually send back to London on Nelson's ship. Ratcliffe wanted to send him back with yet more ore samples, but Smith realized at this point that the chances of paying off investors with riches like gold or copper were slim. Virginia wasn't Mexico. It was, however, a land full of lots of commodities that the British found hard to produce. The wooded areas of England had shrunk, so everything that could be produced from timber would be at least moderately valuable, and it would be reliable. 
Cedar could be used to build ships, and colonists could also process pitch, tar, and pot ashes from wood. Even firewood had become expensive enough in England that many couldn't afford it. Wood was necessary to fuel the fires that enabled glass production, so glass was becoming harder to produce in England, too. And Virginia's lush forests could supply those needs. England had been importing most of its wood products from Central Europe, which is one reason that Smith had requested some poles be recruited. Central Europeans also knew how to build decent wood houses, which was a skill that the English lacked. Smith and Scrivener also put the colonists to work rebuilding the town. Things were starting to improve overall, except for the fact that colonists were repeatedly finding their tools, especially hatchets, going missing. Smith started to worry that this was an act of sedition on behalf of Wahoon Seneca, And when the colonists put the thieves in the stocks for a little while to try to deter them, it didn't work, and Smith's suspicions intensified. A few days later, he and Scrivener were confronted outside of the fort by two Indians who threatened to beat them, and who then followed them into the fort, where they were joined by two well-armed companions. Smith and Scrivener took the four prisoner, and when emissaries came to ask for the release of the captives, Smith demanded the return of all weapons that had been stolen. He also learned that two Englishmen had been taken hostage, and in response he launched raids up and down the Chickahominy until the two were returned. The council asked Smith to interrogate the Indians about the motivation behind the thefts, So he moved the four captives into a small room and brought them out of the room one by one to interrogate them. At the end of each interrogation, he shot off a gun so that the captives thought that he was executing them one by one, and the tactic worked. The captives told Smith that the Paspehe and Chickahominy hated the English and had been planning to ambush and rob them, but that Wahoon Seneca had stopped them from attacking so blatantly, convincing them instead to steal by stealth instead of ambush. They also said that Wahoon Seneca was planning to lure Newport into a trap and attack the settlement. Smith, who had always suspected that the Indians hated the English, was convinced that this was true. The other settlers weren't as sure, and the council berated Smith for his brutal tactics, worried that he might provoke an all-out attack, from which the settlement was in no position to defend itself. Pocahontas, however, soon arrived at the fort again with a companion that reassured the English of the Powhatan's friendship. He assured the English that the attacks were nothing more than the independent actions of some rash captains, and he brought a gift from Opikonganu as an assurance. Smith responded to the friendly gesture with another friendly gesture, and after having the prisoners attend a sermon in Hunt's church, he handed them over to Pocahontas. This was one of the last sermons that Hunt ever gave, and he died shortly afterward. The time had come for Nelson to leave, taking a cargo of cedar with him, as well as John Martin. Smith sent his description of Virginia with Nelson, too. This document was intended to help raise interest in the company, and therefore to attract investors. It was also this document that inspired Hudson to go on the voyage where he found the river that's now named after him, as well as Manhattan Island. Ratcliffe also sent along a document, but this one was addressed personally to Cecil, and it described the infighting and his attempts to create a separate town. He obviously blamed Smith for everything. Smith accompanied Nelson's vessel to Cape Comfort, and then he went on to explore separately. He took 15 men, including Scrivener, the company's doctor, Walter Russell, and Reed, the blacksmith whose revelations had led to Kendall's execution. This time, he was looking for other tribes that might be hostile to the Powhatan, including the Massawomack and the Minoan. The trip ended up being a relatively positive one. When they encountered a village experiencing a deadly illness outbreak, Russell managed to give them medicine that helped to alleviate it, and this increased goodwill in the area. Soon, they were joined by a friendly Indian named Mosco, whose full beard made Smith suspect that he was the son of a Frenchman. When they saw some warriors emerge from the trees ready to attack, Smith shot his gun into the water to intimidate them, and it worked. The company soon learned that they'd been sent by Wahoon Seneca at Ratcliffe's encouragement. Ratcliffe had told Wahoon Seneca about the factions among the settlers and had indicated to the Powhatan that they could benefit more from English relations if Smith were out of the way. 
The attack was dispersed, though, and they continued their exploration, and Moscow led them to a mine where they gathered minerals that were used to paint some of their idols. Russell's medicine was useful again when Smith nearly died from a racing while trying to catch fish with a sword. After this encounter, they briefly returned to Jamestown, where the colonists begged Smith to depose Ratcliffe, who had been treating them cruelly and who had ordered them to build a governor's mansion to the exclusion of more productive endeavors. Smith did depose Ratcliffe and put Scrivener in charge before heading out to explore again. Now, this round of exploration was a fascinating one, but I won't go into too much detail about it. You can read more about it on the website or Facebook page, but I don't want to distract from the overall narrative here with something that could easily be its own episode. They met Moscow again, and suffice it to say that it was mostly peaceful, and that Smith really engaged almost as a member of Indian society. He participated in diplomacy, he bluffed his way out of confrontation, he got the most detailed information yet on the people who inhabited the land south of the Chesapeake. The two most noteworthy events, though, were when they dispersed an attempted Massawomack attack and captured an injured soldier who said that they had attacked because they'd been told that the English were, quote, a people coming from under the world to take their world from them. Moscow also left as they finished their voyage, and as he left, he promised that his people would always be the friends of the English and that they would plant corn purposefully for them and that he was going to change his name to Otisan Tua, which meant wearer of leg coverings, and which was derived from the term that the Powhatan used to refer to Europeans. They never heard from him again, though. When they returned to Jamestown, Jamestown was yet again on the brink of collapse. Illness had swept through the camp, many were dead, some were sick, and Scrivener himself had just recovered. Provisions had been spoiled by the rain, and no preparation had been made for for the new arrivals that they were expecting. Two newcomers, Thomas Webb and Hugh Price, had joined Ratcliffe at the heart of the conflict. Like Ratcliffe and Kendall, Webb had clearly been sent by Cecil and was similarly mysterious. Price was also connected to Cecil, having come to know him when he helped put down the Essex Rebellion. Interestingly, it was Price who had reported Gosnold's anti-James talk at the dinner table, which was the incident that got him removed from the company's paperwork. We'll probably never know exactly what Cecil was up to, but the impact of his actions was disfiguring the government at Jamestown and yet again pushing the colony to the brink of disaster. Fortunately, Ratcliffe's tenure expired around this time, and Smith was easily elected president of the council. He abandoned Ratcliffe's governor's mansion project, and he started work on a storehouse and sprucing up the church, as well as rebuilding the palisade in the recommended five-sided design. He sent Percy to train for corn, and he made everyone in the colony do regular military exercises. Smith can't have been particularly pleased to see Newport arrive just as he'd started the process that he felt would stabilize the colony. Newport had brought 70 more settlers, including the requested Poles and Germans, and the first two women to a settle at Jamestown. One was the wife and one was the maid of a new settler, and the new settler was somebody at whose house John Sycamore had preached and who was fleeing a murder accusation. Also on board were two men named Waldo and Wynne who were to serve on the council and who were clearly replacements for Kendall, which means that they were either spying for Cecil or the Spanish. Wynne's name had turned up in the gunpowder plot investigation at about the same time as Ratcliffe's. Namontok had also returned. On his English visit, he'd visited the king as well as Percy's brother, who was still in the tower, and his cellmate, Walter Raleigh as well as various other members of London's intellectual and exploration-minded elite. Finally, there was Francis West, the 22-year-old nephew of the Privy Councillor Thomas West, Lord de la War, or Delaware. Once again, the Virginia Company had been stingy with its provisions, this time not even sending adequate supplies for the new settlers it had sent. Of the supplies that it had sent, many were novelties that the settlers had no use for. Once again, Newport took over the colony and ordered people to search for sources of extravagant wealth instead of following Smith's recommendation of building up reliable commodities like pitch, tar, and glass. 
In addition, the London Company had started a new experiment, and one which it would toy with on and off through the next few years. To recruit new settlers while building the public reputation of the colony, the company had gone to various parishes in London and offered to take their less desirable citizens off their hands. So now, instead of just having to deal with political intrigue, faction fighting, native hostility, hunger, disease, heat, cold, and yet another batch of inadequate supplies, the colonists also had to take care of the people that England couldn't wait to get rid of. Some fit in all right, but on the whole they proved to be extremely unruly, disruptive, and damaging. At least a couple were members of a Puritan separatist group that produced the Pilgrims, which were called the Brownists, and we'll get to them later. At this point in time, it probably looks to you like all the Virginia Company really does is come in every few months, wreak havoc, and leave using a captain that steals from the colonists in Virginia and from the shareholders in England. Well, it looks to me like that, and it looked like that to John Smith. Perhaps the only people who didn't feel this way were the leaders of the Virginia Company itself. They blamed the colonists, and they sent a letter with Captain Newport accusing the colonists of infighting, which is undeniably true. They also accused the settlers of hiding valuables for themselves, and of planning to split off from the company so that they could personally profit from anything of value. The accusations led to an ultimatum. Newport was not to return to England without one of the following. He could bring 2,000 pounds of pitch and tar, a route to the South Sea, or one of the Roanoke settlers. If Newport returned without one of those items, the company would withdraw all support and leave the settlers to fend for themselves, not even bringing them back to England. Smith, as you can guess, wanted to start getting to work producing pitch and tar. Newport, as you can guess, wanted to take a trip inland to explore. The council supported Newport, Smith was furious, and Newport said that the reason Smith hadn't been able to make the discoveries himself was because he'd been too cruel to the local peoples, and Newport was going to fix that. The Virginia Company had decided that it was important to win over the Powhatan to the English, and it felt that the way to do this was to coronate Wahoon Seneca. The idea behind this was similar to a tactic that the English had used in Ireland, they had given the local leaders English titles like the Earl of Tyrone to encourage loyalty to the crown. Now, it's not like the peerage of Ireland was some brilliant success, but there were a couple of differences here. First, Virginia was not Ireland. There was no real significance to the act, the way that the peerage of Ireland had at least given the Irish political representation in the House of Lords. Wahoon Seneca was already the leader of Sinakomoko. The English were looking to him for help, not trying to pacify a dominated people. To go along with that, they also weren't talking about making Wahoon Seneca an earl or a duke. They were talking about coronating him as a king. It was an absolutely idiotic plan, and Smith said that it would absolutely destroy the ability of the English to trade with the Powhatan. The English had a finite amount of stuff that they could trade for food with the Indians, and the Virginia Company didn't send them enough to be stable. Meanwhile, they came in every few months and messed up the planting of crops. And if Wahoon Seneca developed a lower opinion of the English, it would prove fatal. Newport responded that Smith was just trying to hide how cruelly he'd behaved toward the Indians in his absence. Newport had the company and the council behind him, and knowing he couldn't stop it, Smith decided to take part. So he returned to Werowokomoko with Namantak, and after sending him back to live with the Powhatan, they invited Wahoon Seneca to Jamestown to receive his gifts. Wahoon Seneca's response was cold, even hostile. He refused to go to Jamestown and insisted that the English come to Werowokomoko, and they complied. He told them that there was no salt water behind the mountains, as he had originally said there was, and he said that he didn't need the English help to fight the Monacans. He wouldn't help the English continue to explore, and he wouldn't give them any guide except for Namantak. The ceremony itself was so awkward that Wahoon Seneca was afraid that it was an assassination plot, and he was worried throughout the whole ceremony. He was tall enough that Newport couldn't put the crown on his head until he stooped over. And then when they let off a volley of shot in his honor, he was concerned that they were preparing to shoot him. 
Once the ceremony was done, though, Wahun Seneca inverted the meaning and said that it was the English subjects paying tribute to him. Actually, no, that didn't invert the meaning at all. That is what the ceremony meant. So that summer, when the English were working in their fields, he would occasionally come over wearing his crown and cape. He was a brilliant leader. This was an idiotic plan. Smith saw it coming, but no one in power listened. With or without Powhatan help, Newport decided to go explore Monacan territory, while Smith stayed at Jamestown and put the men to work collecting timber. They built the glass house, whose ruins you can see at Jamestown today, and Smith also enforced moral discipline, throwing a cup of water over colonists' heads for every swear word that they uttered. Within a week, the work was getting done swear-free, and Smith also started sending groups out into the wilderness to learn how to survive in the forest. Newport's venture, on the other hand, was predictably and totally fruitless, and once again his ship was a floating marketplace where sailors traded the settlers' supplies to the highest bidder, meaning the Indians. The settlement needed more food, so Smith went to the Chickahominies, and they refused to trade. He replied that he was there to avenge the deaths of his people in the last years and threatened to attack, and they filled up two barges with corn, one captained by Smith and the other by Percy, and returned to Jamestown. When Smith returned, some of the leadership was happy to see him, and others said that he should be banished for leaving his post without their consent. Newport returned again to England without recouping his costs and without the demanded items. He did, however, bring back two leaders of infighting, Ratcliffe and Archer, and Smith sent his map of Virginia, as well as whatever industrial goods he'd been able to produce. Wood, a couple barrels of stone, possible iron ore, and early attempts to create pitch, tar, and glass, along with an absolutely scathing letter. In his letter, Smith said that the company had wasted valuable resources, that they had confused relations with the Indians, that their claims about the settlers exaggerating the land's resources were unfair, and that their demands for more commodities were unrealistic. The threat to cut off supplies was cruel, not least because they were being consumed by the mariners who brought them, and the council may have been torn apart by faction fighting. That was true, but the cause of that was the people who the London Company itself had appointed to run it. That, Smith said, was why Ratcliffe was being sent back, and if either he or Archer ever returned they would keep the colony continuously in factions. He said that was the reason the colony hadn't been more profitable, and that was the reason why right now the company couldn't expect any returns. Here's a map, and by the way, I have done all of this for less than the cost of one of Newport's expeditions. It was a shining moment, and the company actually listened but there was still serious fallout from their actions, and we'll get into that next week. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter, and you can find those links at the website AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.